So now I've got a little bit of bad news for you about SN1 reactions. So we said it's all about the carbocation. So we form a carbocation rate turning step. And the bad news is that carbocations can undergo what are called rearrangements. Now they don't always rearrange, so but very often they do. And you've got to be able to distinguish when and when they won't rearrange. And so the governing principle here is that uh, generally a carbocation has the option to rearrange to any adjacent carbon if it gets more stable as a carbocation. So if we take a look at this reaction down below, the uh, question says predict the major substitution product for this reaction. And it turns out for this one, it's gonna go through a rearrangement to get to the major product, and we'll show why. So first step is that leaving group's going to leave. And that's gonna leave a carbocation there. So and in this case, we should look and see that this is a secondary carbocation. It's directly bonded to two other carbons. So and those two carbons are these two right here. And the ones it's bonded to, those are the options for where it might rearrange. So you might recall the trend for carbocation stability is that the more substituted carbocation is the more stable one. So a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary, secondary more stable than primary, primary more stable than methyl. So in this case, if either of those adjacent carbons would be more stable than our secondary carbocation that currently exists, then a rearrangement would happen and the major product would proceed through that rearrangement. Well, we've got a secondary one right here and that's no more stable. It's equally stable, but no more stable. It's got to get more stable, so no rearrangement there. But the one down below is a tertiary and that would be a more stable carbocation. So the way this kind of works, and I've got to kind of draw this hydrogen in because we're going to use it here in a second. So the way this works, this tertiary carbon down here says, oh, that secondary carbocation, I feel so bad for you. You've only got three bonds, that's why you're a carbocation. You've only got three bonds since bromine left and you're not stable and you know what? If I was the only one with three bonds, I'd be more stable than you. You know what? You can have one of mine. I'm just gonna take and give you my hydrogen. This hydrogen just takes the electrons with it and all and reattaches over at that carbon. And we call that a hydride shift. So this particular carbocation rearrangement is called a hydride shift. And once the hydrogen reattaches over on that secondary carbon, that carbon now has four bonds. But this carbon right here is now the one with only three bonds. And so he's now the carbocation. So and he's no longer sp3 hybridized, he's sp2 hybridized. So he's no longer tetrahedral, he's trigonal planar. And that's why I've drawn the bond here to this, the methyl group as a straight line to reflect that it's a trigonal planar geometry now instead. So it's finally now we've got this tertiary carbocation. That's where we're gonna do nucleophilic attack. But before we go there, we should realize that most carbocation rearrangements only occur once, but you might have two successful ones in some cases. In fact, we'll see an example like that shortly. So let's draw that better. It's a tertiary one there, but the adjacent carbons, none of them are gonna be any better. We've got a secondary here, a secondary here, a primary here. Our tertiary carbocation is done rearranging. And now our methanol is gonna come in and attach. And so we've got our methyl group there. We've now got an oxygen bonded to a CH3, but still bonded to a hydrogen. And you might recognize that, oh, we've got an oxygen with three bonds and a positive charge. We're not done. Whatever our solvent is, is going to come into a proton transfer reaction and deprotonate this thing. Well, our solvent's not water in this case. It's methanol. So we're going to have a methanol molecule, draw one in as needed, come in and deprotonate getting us to our final product. So then I'll draw that off way down over here, save some room, but our final product's gonna look like, still got the methyl group there, and have an OCH3 right here. There's our final product. We didn't form any chiral centers or anything, so I don't have to worry about stereochemistry. Uh, we just get that one achiral product. So in this example, I wanna go through a little more complicated example of a carbocation rearrangement. And this one's gonna be called a ring expansion. You can see in our reactant here, we've got a four-membered ring, but in our product here, we've got a five-membered ring, evidence of a ring expansion. So, and these can be a little bit tricky until you kinda of see the pattern and stuff like that. Uh, much more complicated than the hydride shift we did in the last example. So let's take a look here. First step in our SN1 reaction is the leaving group's going to leave. And that's gonna give us a secondary carbocation. So, and our two adjacent carbons, one is primary and one is tertiary. So we found a favorable rearrangement that is possible. Now this carbon over here does have a hydrogen, but if we do a hydride shift, we're still gonna have a four-membered ring and our, it's our carbocation rearrangement that gets us the option to have the five-membered ring. So instead of 
transferring this bond over to our carbocation, we're going to transfer this one over. And so we're going to take this bond and reattach it right there. So it's going to break between these two atoms, reattach between these two. And I'm going to draw this off to the side a little bit ugly. I'll, I'll fix it in a little bit here. So, but we're going to form, oh, we're not going to form that. Let's try going backwards here. So the bond that broke is the one I just erased there. So that bond is broke. We still have the ethyl group there, but we're reattaching the bond that broke right into this location instead. That way, this carbon now has four bonds, no longer a carbocation, but the carbon right next door who gave the bond away only has three, and he's now our carbocation. Now, you might be like, wait a minute, Chad. We had a secondary carbocation, so, and this guy gave away one of his bonds to carbon, so he used to be tertiary, but he's actually only secondary now. So we went from a secondary carbocation to a secondary carbocation. Well, that's exactly right. So, and he's not more stable because he went and got more substituted. He's more stable because we actually relieved ring strain. There's a fair amount of ring strain in a four-membered ring, significantly less in a five-membered ring. So this thing got more stable, not because it got more substituted, but because we relieved some ring strain. So if we take a look, now I'm gonna draw this pretty. So I drew it ugly just so I could see what it looked like and matched up kind of the way it looked before and got a methyl group there. I've got a carbocation on the adjacent carbon there. So, and that's the structure we've got. Uh, in this case though, I see that's not where my OH is gonna end up, not where that carbocation is. So we actually have another rearrangement ahead of us. We have a secondary carbon here and this adjacent carbon right here is a tertiary carbon. So we're actually gonna do one more rearrangement. And this one, this carbon's got a hydrogen. This one is going to be a hydride shift. So, and this hydrogen is just going to up and reattach right to that carbon. So, that's leaving this carbon here now with four bonds, no longer a carbocation, but this carbon here who gave the hydrogen away now only has three bonds, so he's our carbocation. So, now this thing is done rearranging. So, and it's not so much like, you know, we have to predict how, how far it goes, something like that, but I know what product I want. And it's that carbon right there, which is that carbon right there. That's where I want the water to attack. So the OH ends up there. And so now our water molecule is gonna come and attach. So a nucleophilic attack here, and we'll end up with this structure here. You might recognize, oh, Chad, we've got three bonds and to an oxygen with a positive charge. And we're not done yet. We're gonna do a proton transfer. And whatever our solvent is, we'll deprotonate. And in this case, our solvent is water. So we'll just draw another water molecule in. So, and he'll come and deprotonate one of those hydrogens, getting us to our final product here. So this gets us right to our final product as long as, as well as forming a molecule of hydronium here. So that's the arrow pushing for how we get here. Now note the question here, it says show the mechanism. So generally we're not gonna try and have you predict these complicated ring expansion products. It's usually not a predict the product type question. So, and maybe even, you know, the researcher that maybe did this theoretically uh, wasn't expecting this product, but if you did form this product, the question is show me how it was formed. So that's generally the, how this kind of question would be uh, asked, not so much a predict the product question.